Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 129, Filling the Gap. Card-based filler games and why you should play them. I'm Sean, and with me, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo T. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your game and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Remember, we record live Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop when I stream to the right channel. <laughs> yes. Uh, tonight, I decided to pick one of the oldest questions in our pile. I actually went there and I'm like, what's it? What, what's the oldest question someone's asked? And they're like, all right, gaming went back at school. No, okay, we got to skip that. And the next one was gaming on lunch break with my, no, no, we're going to skip that. But then I got to a question from Uncle Rico, who is looking for filler card games. Following that, I've got a review of a mostly card-driven dream that's probably best for filling your trash bin. Finally, in the week of review, I've got some more plays of Quacks of Quedlinburg, and I got Techlandia off the pile of obligation. And I've actually got thoughts on an advanced copy of a book we got a uh, hold of. Welcome to The Suggestion Box. Here we highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. Another week with lots of feedback and interaction. I love it. Keep them coming. Keep them coming. I love those comments. All right, I'm going to start off with some super stuff. So since that was Sean's main topic a few weeks back, I'm going to let Sean respond to these. So first up, we have Chris Groff, who writes, Good read. I played several of these, as well as others that didn't make your list. For my taste, I found that Marvel Heroic hit closest to home on what I want out of a supers game. It most emulated the kind of crazy, unpredictable action that you find in comics. Next, Jeff Voigt writes, I'm playing a long-running M&M, that's Meet and Some Masterminds, campaign. It's also based on 3X. I didn't know that. But part of its complexity is in the ways it's different. I constantly have to look up rules, and I'm unclear on some of its terminology. Now, I'm currently reading the Sentinels RPG, and while it has its own complexities, I look forward to getting it to the table. Finally, we're going to finish off with Carrie McDonnell, who wrote, Interesting. I like the three-part breakdown of power levels, but at the same time, that's why I'm taken aback a bit by superhero gaming itself. It's just too darn artificial. You always have to play by its conceits. Otherwise, villains like the Joker or Lex Luthor are pushovers, and the Flash defeats everyone. Anything to say about those? Sure. Well, thanks first off all for all of your writing in. Supers are certainly a major part of media right now, so mm -hmm. it's not surprisingly a hot topic. Chris, so many people have great things to say about Marvel Heroic, uh, and it's not something I'd ever write off as a, something I'm not interested in, but I do admit personally that the DC and Marvel offerings, just saying that you're running them, puts people in a certain mindset mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and pushes things in directions, whereas something not connected to a publisher that leaves people a little more open. Fair. Now, Jeb, I feel you. As much as I'm interested in Mutants and Mastermind, I feel like it would be really best suited to a virtual tabletop of some sort to help with all those rules and mechanics and punch. Now, as for Carrie, I understand where you're coming from, but for me, for most people, I think, superheroes are escapism. Mm. Sure, the friction on the exposed skin of the Flash would tear off his flesh, and the Joker is unable to function as a basic adult, let alone plot devious and carefully timed plans. But I want to believe, so I do. Yeah, I have to agree with him there. It, it, superhero games are all about the conceits, but that's why you play them, is to play up the tropes and to play up the genre and to be superheroes. That's what, to me, sets it apart from other types of media. Now, on the same topic, Keiche Davies commented, I suspect Guardians of Order decided to go with D20 for Silver Age Sentinels because at the time, D20 was the biggest part of the market. It's basically built on the same chassis they used for Big Eye's Small Mouth D20, which got ported for pretty much the same reason. Also, a note that he is a Canadian creator, so that was a Canadian role-playing game as well. Now, Eric Franklin, who both of us game with on BGA, responded to Keith's comments, actually, to say Silver Age Sentinels was released both D20 and TriStat. Now, the TriStat Silver Age Sentinels is reportedly much better aside from the usual tri-stat system imbalance issues. But I've never read the D20 version, so I can't say with certain. Well, I'm not actually going to address these directly, but I am going to point out that I didn't pay enough attention to who the author of Silver, Sage Sentinel, Silver Age Sentinels was. 
Now, I do understand why, when I talked about it, there was so much problematic content to bring up. Mm -hmm. And I'm just going to say my apologies for including that in a list that I now realize it shouldn't be mentioned in. Yeah, what I'll, I'll probably go into the blog version and actually delete that one out there then. And I did not mention the name just to not give any yep. publicity where it's undue. Now, we're going to jump over to some comments on our topic of games from Indigenous designers. Gary Malmuth commented, great content, guys. And Brian Sheen, patron who asked the question in the first place, said, awesome episode. Thank you for tackling this topic. Your journey from ancient to modern was brilliant. Your research validated my suspicion that the native voice in the gaming industry is woefully underserved. Well, thanks for the comments, Gary and Brian. I am very happy with how well this topic has been received. And I have to agree with you, Brian. I would love to hear more Native voices in the industry. As mentioned during the topic, I really do hope that recent successes of games like Coyote and Crow do help open the doors and we start seeing more Native content. Absolutely. We're going to finish off with some comments on our topic of keeping up your gaming life after having kids that we did last week. First up, MREX21Z says... Having kids pretty much means the end of everything for at least 18 years. And that would be one of those naysayers Jeff mentioned in his question from that week. The entire point of our discussion was to show that that does not have to be the case. And I'm sorry if it was for you, Rex21Z. Now, on a much more positive note, we have Robert Rosenthal who commented, Having kids does not end your gaming, in my humble opinion, but it does change it. For us, we had a regular game night with neighbors. So the change there was that one of us had to be at one of the parents' houses while the kids were little, mm. and one parent might not show due to having to stay home with their baby as needed. However, as the kids grow, you have gamers in your household. Mm -hmm. You do it right. They even want a game more often than you play yourself. This year of COVID with my 10-year-old daughter has been great. We got lots of games out ran games with some of her friends and have sessions with my friends that include our, my daughter. Plus, she loves to paint minis with me. Nice. We are working with her and her friends to run their own games. So, all in all, the late night marathons are rare, but the enjoyment and opportunities are boundless. The only issue now is I raised a monster who has my values, and that can't be good. <laughs> now, Matthew Thomason also wrote in to say, Mo, this is interesting, as I actually found I game more after my kids. Limited money plus evenings in with kids in bed equals game time. Our typical night is kids, four and two, in bed for 7 p.m., game on the table ready to go and start straight after. Oh, thanks for the great comments there, Robert and Matthew. I appreciate hearing from other parents that have found ways to make it work. And it seems like you might have done a better job than we did with that. I wish both our kids were in bed by seven back when they were younger. Work for the first one, not for the second. Now, thanks for great comments, Robert and Matthew. Uh, that's it for this week's comments. Send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com or hit us up on social media. One quick announcement before we get on to our main topic tonight. All right, you've got one week left in our Terraforming Mars digital giveaway. Head over to tabletopbellhop.com and find a link to the giveaway at the top under Tabletop Game Deals or take some time and browse through the page until you find the article. Or just follow the link below in the show notes. Note, if you are listening to this live, uh, not sorry, not live, if you're listening to this on your podcatcher and the podcast just dropped today, which is Tuesday mornings, you've got one day left to enter. Everything's going to end at 11.59 Eastern Daylight Time. So hurry up and get over there. And if you're listening after that fact, I'm sorry it's over. You should have entered earlier. We're here to answer your game, gaming or game night questions. Tonight, we've got a topic from Uncle Rico, who writes, Hey, Tabletop Bellhop. Have any good filler card game recommendations? Just picked up Push and No Thanks and looking for more games to play with the extended family. Oh, thanks for the question, Uncle Rico. And I got to say, with those two games, you're off to a great start. While I think most people listening know that I do tend to prefer heavier, longer games, there is still a spot in my collection and my game nights for some filler games. For me, filler games serve a few different purposes. To start, I think they're a great icebreaker. 
something you break out at the very start of game night to just get everyone in that gaming mindset and to get everyone's focus on the table instead of milling about and socializing and chatting. Most filler games are really good, though, so that you can still chat and hang out while playing. So it's it's good to get that, you know, talk in the, hey, what's going on? How was your work week? What have you been doing? How are the kids? And all that, that chit-chat that kind of get it out of the way while you're playing the filler game so that you can focus on the heavier games later. Not to mention, great for when you're just waiting on that one or two more people mm-hmm. who haven't shown up yet and you want to fill the time. Exactly. I wonder why they're called fillers. Next up, I love having filler games on hand for game nights with large groups. Like I, I have a fairly extensive game room and I will have 12 people or more over on for special events, usually birthdays, New Year's, not on an average game night. But we'll have three or four different games going at once. Plus, I had, at least back when we could, I hosted a ton of public play events almost every weekend here in Windsor. And I love having filler games for both. Now, their role here is something different. What these are for is for someone, something for people to play while waiting for people. Now, these are great with kind of like what Sean mentioned, where you're, where you're waiting for people to show up, but even more so. So you're waiting for people to show up or you just showed up to the event and everyone's already busy playing something. I like having some filler games on hand that are dead simple so that people can sit down and play them while waiting for, you know, the main tables or waiting for one game to finish. And that's also true in the middle of the event. So you got three different tables of people playing and they all kind of want to switch up and play with different people in the next round. Well, if one table finishes first, they can always pick up a filler game or something quick to play while waiting for the other tables to finish. So I always have filler games with me anytime I go to host a game night. Right, And just a brain break between heavier stuff can be helpful too, which leads us to... Having fillers on hand just to unwind. After playing an epic three or four hour or six hour game, sometimes I just want to break and I want to play something more casual. These are also great for filling the gap at the end of game night. So you're playing till 10 o'clock and you wrap up at 9.15, 45 minutes isn't enough time to start another game at Terraforming Mars, but that's the perfect chance to break out some type of filler game and tie one on before calling it a night. Well, and getting back to Uncle Rico's question, they aren't just looking for filler games, but filler hard game specifically. Right. They also note games for playing with extended family, which I'm going to guess are non-gamers. Yeah, usually when people talk about gaming with extended family, they're not talking about, you know, the hardcore war gamers over at Uncle Billy's house. Card-based games, I think, are perfect for this because most non-gamers are at least familiar with playing card games, right? They know a standard deck of bicycle playing cards. They probably know how to play solitaire. They may know euchre, spades, hearts, or poker, or some other form of card gaming. So getting them to play a non-playing card game, but a game with cards, is going to be way easier than throwing down some score-based resource management Euro game. Cards with numbered pictures are just familiar, even if the pictures aren't. Dropping a hex map and some sheep down might scare off people. Totally agree. So what follows is going to be a list of card-based filler games that I personally have enjoyed. Now, this style of game is very popular, both on the hobby side of things as well as in the mass market. And there are a ton of card games that play in 15 minutes to half an hour. Like, that's just a huge category. So there's no way this list should be considered all-inclusive. This isn't even close. I know I haven't played them all. So also, please don't get mad if I didn't list your favorite game because there's just a good chance I haven't tried it yet. I'm not going to get to most or all, definitely not all, probably not even most, maybe not even many of the games in this genre. What I am going to get to, though, are the ones that I personally had the most fun playing and the games I would consider bringing out to game nights myself out of my collection. Now, as usual, this list is in no particular order. All right. I am going to start off with the one Uncle Rico mentioned that he just picked up, which is No Thanks, which I think this is one that should be in almost everyone's collection. Now, Uncle Rico already has a copy, so he doesn't need this suggestion, but this is for anyone else looking to pick up a filler game. Now, I tried this game when my friend Jamie introduced it to me back in the days when I would have sworn I don't like filler games. When I was like, I don't want to play this. Let's play a real game. Like, this is a joke party game. I don't want to do this. Because the game is dead simple to learn. You have a bunch of numbered cards. Someone pass you a card, you either keep the card or you toss a chip on it and say, nope, thanks. And then you pass it along to the next person. And it just keeps going around until eventually someone's got to take the cards, but then they get the chip so they can say no later, right? And this is one of those games where you don't want points. So you don't want any cards, 
But the neat bit here is that if you are able to make a straight of any length, only the lowest number in that straight counts. That's the brilliance of no thanks. And despite my aversion to filler games at that time, I've had a lot of ton fun playing no thanks. It has the added bonus of actually having a higher player count too. So it's great for those group events to get everyone playing together before you split up. And that was no thanks. Next, I've got Gorus Maximus. I wanted to put this on the list just as to, to counter off the Fox in the Forest, which I think I might have actually taken Fox in the Forest off the list since then, because Fox in the Forest only plays two players. So one recommended, if you, if you want a two-player game to have on hand, Fox in the Forest is good. And I totally forgot that I took Fox in the Forest off, and I'm keeping this on, because the whole reason for this one is it's got a huge player count scale. It is a trick-taking game. So think Hearts, Euchre, Poker, but you can play up to eight players and just having an eight player trick taking game that works, I think is brilliant. Um, there's a neat mechanic in here where the Trump can change halfway through a suit, which I think is kind of neat. It's got some really cool looking, but gory artwork. I am a big fan of Goris Maximus. Just check out the blog. You can find the review or find our podcast when we reviewed it. As we mentioned before, when talking about Goris Maximus, there is also a much more family friendly version called Sea Change. Yes. But that was Goris Maximus. Next, I've got Flip City. This is a small box deck building game with a static market. So meaning that what's available in the market is always the same. For a deck builder, it's super easy to teach and features really unique mechanic with two-sided cards where while playing some cards, you can upgrade other cards and to upgrade them, you just flip them to the other side. At two players, this is a quick filler. Now, I do have to warn you, if you go up to the full player count of four, it does slow down. So it might be a little longer than you want for a filler. But with two or three, you should be able to get in a game in under half an hour. And what I love about this is it's got that feel of a bigger deck building game. I don't know any of the bigger deck building games that can be played that quickly. And that was Flip City. Next, I have one that I know Sean is a fan of, and that is Sushi Go, the pick and pass card game. This is one of the most pure drafting games I've ever played. And by drafting here, we're not drafting from a central market, but rather you have a hand of cards, you keep one card, and you pass the rest to another player. This is really simple to teach and play. And it's very easy. It's just a matter of trying to collect sets of different types of sushi. Like, I basically taught you how to play right now. All I'd be able to have to explain is how the different types of cards score. This is great for non-gamers because it's so approachable. It's so simple. And the cute sushi artwork just makes it very approachable. Now, there is a party edition, which, as far as I can tell, is the better way. I'll admit I haven't tried it myself. It supposedly has some rule tweaks and is bigger for an even bigger group. So if you can get it and you have big group, like if you're, you're always playing with your friends, your four players look at Sushi Go. But if you're ever bringing out the parties or public play events, you probably want to look for the Sushi Go party edition. And that was the game I have played 90 times on Board Game <laughs> Arena, Sushi Go. Next, I have a game that I wouldn't have put on this list until I was bribed with beer to play it at a game convention because I just thought I would hate it. Uh, that's Happy Salmon. Note, Jen, I never got that beer. Now, this is a game I still kind of hate because I hate trying to play something else when there's a group of people playing Happy Salmon in the room. This is the loudest, most raucous game I've ever seen and heard. Groups playing this just take over whatever space they're in. So be aware of that. If you're the only people playing, great. But if someone's sitting over in the corner trying to teach an 18xx, maybe you want to keep Happy Salmon or go play outside or something. Now, this game is dumb, silly fun where players are going to flip a card over and it's going to tell you to do something. And you have to find someone else doing that same action, whether that's like a high five, a happy salmon, which is like this slappy thing, or you flip spots in the room and you're running around and playing cards and it's just crazy fun. Now, the winner is the first one to go through all the cards in the front of them. And I, I thought I'd hate it, but I got to admit, and I hadn't had the beer yet. I actually had quite fun, quite a bit of fun playing happy salmon. But again, don't play it when other people are trying to focus on anything near you. And that was Happy Salmon. All right, sticking with light, silly games, I've got Monster Match. This is going to be one I'm going to consider a hidden gem because when I did research on this, because every time I do one of these lists, I do it on my own, and then I go look and I try to find other people's top 10 lists and go, oh, did I forget anything? No one had this game on their list, so this, this has got to be a hidden gem. This is also from North Star Games, same publisher as Happy Salmon, and it's a game called Monster Match. This is like 
calm happy salmon sort of it's it's still real time loud silly fun but you can play it sitting down like you're you're around a table you're not jumping around you're not slapping people you're not swapping spots or anything like that now this is a matching game where you're going to put a bunch of cards out on the table that pictures of monsters and then you're going to roll two dice one dice has a number on it and the other one will have features so it'll say legs arms tentacles eyes and mouths maybe or teeth i forget and they'll say like six eyes and you have to find a monster on the board that has six eyes and put your finger on it and if someone else has their finger on it they don't get to take the card then everyone keeps the cards they were able to get at the end of the game once you're through the entire deck whoever has the most monsters in front of them wins dead simple like this is your kids could play this like six-year-olds could probably play this though they'd have to be able to count know what a six is so as long as your kids can count you can play this game this is a perfect non-gamer party game drinking game get people interacting with each other and the kind of game you can easily convince non-gamers to play because it feels more of an activity than a game and it's super cute artwork this is one i actually wish i owned i played it at origins i've got to thank uh newer boots for showing me the game so great hidden gem because no one else seems to be talking about this game now, that was Monster Match, but I want to point out that it is not the 2002 Ravensburger Monster Match. Uh -huh. It is a newer uh, game by a number of uh, publishers, such as Cosmos and North Star Games, which is yeah, the, North 2018, America, North Star Games. the 2018 Monster Match. Oh, there you see. I played it the year it came out at Origins then. Up next, we have one that I'm pretty sure everyone expected to be on this list, and that is Codenames. Uh, this is a great filler game for pretty much any size group. You can even go down as small as two, but you will have to pick up the duet edition of Codenames. I am recommending either, to be honest. Uh, the duet version is cooperative, and the other one's competitive. You're going to split into teams, and players are trying to get the members of their teams to pick out words, word cards, based on one-word clues. Now, you have to be careful to not have your team pick the other team's words, and you got to watch out for the dreaded assassin word, where if anyone picks that, their whole team loses. Now, the thing that's great about Codenames as a filler is that you can stop after any round. Like, I assume there's some kind of scoring system in Codenames. Duet, I know their system. It's, it's different. It's a win or lose, there's, but there's like a campaign mode. The Codenames must have some kind of scoring system, but honestly, in the number of times I've played the game, I don't even know what it is. We just play until we're sick of it. What's great about this one is you can play one round just to get everyone at the table together to play, or you can actually just keep playing all night. I have seen a game night at the uh, Green Bean downtown here in Windsor where there was a game of Codenames going the entire event for six hours. We set up a game at the beginning and people came and went, but the whole night there was Codenames going. So uh, the official rules state that the game ends when all of one team's agents are identified or when one team has identified the assassin. So it's one round. So there is no camp. I thought there might have been like, and the team gets points, and then the first one does nope. so many points. <laughs> no, none of that. Nope. But that now, was one thing I do nope. like about Code Names too is this is also a really good get to know each other game. So if you're doing public play gaming, this is a good one where the where um usually when the round ends, you have this like Q and A period where you're like, what the heck did that clue mean? Or how was that supposed to relate to that? And then someone tells some story about, oh, when we were camping one time, there was this time, and I thought Dave would get that. That is an actual big part of the social aspect of code names that I think is great for that playing with extended family or playing with playing in public or with strangers. Absolutely. And that was code names. Next, Uncle Rico did say code name card games. But I think I'll include this card-driven activity, which is the mind anyway. No, I'm joking. I do think this is a game. I just know every time we mention that someone's going to come up and try to tell me it's not a game. You can win or lose in the mind. That alone makes it a game. There are rules. You can win, you can lose. Done. Anyway, the mind is another one that works great at many different player counts. And honestly, in my opinion, works going above the recommended four players. Because for some reason, the mind says it's limited to four. But like I played with as many as eight. Now, I will admit... I'm pretty sure there's not enough cards in the game to get through all 13 rounds with more players, but I don't think you're going to make it that far anyway, because <laughs> the mind is rather difficult. Uh, in this game, players are trying to play numbered cards and from their hands in sequential order, but the trick is you can't communicate with each other. What I also like about the mind is all you need is the ability to count to play this. So this one's great for non-gamers and kids. Absolutely. And that was the mind. 
Next, I have another classic for sale. This is a real estate-based Stephen Dora game that's great for introducing those family members who have fond memories of Monopoly. So if they liked Monopoly, you're like, oh, you mean like games like Monopoly? You're like, yeah, I kind of like Monopoly because you buy and sell property, right? This is a great one to kind of slip in there for those Monopoly fans. Now, this one does need at least three players, but plays up to six. And the game's broken into two rounds. The first round, you're auctioning off properties to everyone. You go through the whole deck. So everyone amasses a bunch of properties. And then the second round, you're trying to sell those properties and hopefully make a profit. The player with the most money at the end wins. This is also a great gateway to heavier economic games. So if you want to, if people like, wow, that was so much better than Monopoly, because anyone who plays for sale better say that. And then you're like, oh, let me introduce you to Power Grid, right? It's, it's, the, it's, it's the gateway for, for heavier economic games. And that was for sale. Next, I have Biblios, which I wanted to talk about next because it reminds me a bit of for sale. That's because it also has two phases, though the phases are kind of the opposite of for sale. Because in the first phase, players are distributing a hand of cards to themselves and the other players, as well as a draw deck. So you're going to draw as many cards as the number of players plus one. You're going to keep one for yourself. You're going to give one to each of the other players, and you're going to put one in the draw deck. After all cards are distributed, you now enter an auction phase where those cards you gave yourself are your money to purchase the cards that you put in the draw deck. It's a really fascinating system. Um, it is a little bit more complicated. Um, end game scoring is based on having the majority in different book types. So there is a majority system here. And the, but during the game, you can actually change the value of the different types. So that's another aspect. Uh, this has a few more idiosyncrasies than other games on the list. Uh, this is one, like, you probably don't want to give it to complete non-gamers, right? But, like, if they've got some gaming experience, you may be able to slip Biblios in there. Or maybe you follow it up after playing for sale. But that was Biblios. Next, I have Arboretum. So we're going to, again, stick with somewhat harder games, right? Something heavier. This tree-based game is what I like to call a thinky filler. You're using cards with beautiful artwork of different tree species on them, and you're attempting to build an Arboretum by playing the cards in front of you. Now, points are awarded for having straights of trees, so they have to go up in number. All the numbers have to be connected, or the trees going up in number have to be connected orthogonally. Now, there's some really cool stuff here that adds depth to the game that I don't want to get into too much detail here. But, like, you can draw cards from other players' discard piles. There's a whole area majority system to determine who gets to score which trees. So even if you have the biggest route, if you don't have that majority, you don't even get to count it. Uh, this one is actually quite the brain burner. We found the theme and the artwork draws people in, and even people who normally don't like to think while they're playing games will enjoy this well take the time to learn it so like oh but it looks so beautiful i want to learn this game and that was arboretum swapping back to some lighter fare i've got bean long time listeners of the show will all know we are all all three of us big fans of bonanza uh, this is a bean trading and planting game where there's one rule that is so hard to get people to follow at first and that's that you cannot rearrange your hand of cards. You must always play your cards from the front of your hand, and newly drawn cards go to the back. Now, the thing with putting this game on this list is depending on how many players you have and how much those players negotiate with each other, it can really stretch uh, the length of the game and can kind of push the limits of being a filler. Now, what I do recommend, if you are short on time, that you just play through the deck twice instead of three times or possibly even once. And that was Bonanza, a regular favorite here on this show. It's probably the oldest game we mentioned the most often, to be honest. Like that, that's that's Uwe Rosenberg before he was known for polyominoes, made a game about beans. Next, I have another hidden gem. This is another one I couldn't find on anyone else's list. And to be honest, no one seems to know this game exists. I was sent a copy of this from Z-Man Games years ago for Extra Life and to play it at Extra Life and talk about playing it right at the time. This is before I even reviewed games. And that's a game called Parade. 
This is a Alice in Wonderland themed card game, which is beautiful cards. Players are taking part in a parade to honor the Queen of Hearts. And you're playing cards into a growing row of cards, which represents all the people in the parade. Now, what card you play can affect the cards in the row and where you get rewarded by doing things like matching colors to the last card or playing cards of a higher number than the current length of the parade. So there's five cards in the parade. You play a six, you actually get to collect some cards. Now, a lot of people out there love the card game Guillotine. And people are probably wondering, uh, or they're guessing, I'm going to have that on this list. And I'm not, because I actually think Parade handles that whole card row mechanic. I don't know what the term for that. Like, we talk about trick-taking, talk about ladder games. There's got to be a term for that guillotine style and parade style game. But whatever, whatever that's called, I think guillotine does a better job of it. I think it's more fun. And I also find it's less random. So I feel like I have more control of my destiny in Parade. And this is a great one for people who recognize cards because they just look like playing cards with Alice in Wonderland art. No, they don't have art spades, diamonds, but they're color coded and they just have numbers. And all that really matters is the number and the color. Interestingly, uh, Board Game Geek calls it me mechanism card line. Card line. Card Fair line. enough, I guess. Card line games. Yeah. Yes. So that was Parade. Now, sticking with the whole based on traditional card games theme, I am going to add to the list diamonds. This one's for your family members or non-hobby gamers that like traditional card games, trick-taking games like spades or hearts. And this is, while I have more fun playing Gorus Maximus, this is much more approachable for people who understand spades and hearts in particular because it's based on the same mechanic. Because in diamonds, you are trying to collect the most diamonds, but not diamond cards, but rather diamond tokens. It plays like a traditional trick-taking game, except in this one, you get a bonus for playing off-suit. And when you do so, you manipulate the diamond tokens in play. Things like putting them in your vault where they can't be stolen, gaining diamonds from the bank, or stealing diamonds from other players, and so on. Now, the one big advantage that Diamonds has, which I keep it in my collection for this, is that it plays six players where heart, spades, and poker tend to be four-player only games. So it's good when you've got that fifth or sixth player around. And that was Diamonds. Honshu is my next game, and I put it on this list because it's one of the most unique card games I own because it did or does something totally unique. At least when it came out, it was unique because since then there's been three or four games that use this mechanic. But when Honshu came out, this was new because each card in Honshu is divided into six squares showing different terrain types. So you've got like lakes and residential areas and deserts and forests. And there's a couple resource generation spots and then spots that can consume those resources. Well, the neat bit here is you play, start off with one card in front of you and then every card you play afterwards has to go under your existing cards or above them so that one's nested under the other. So at least one square of the new card is showing and you don't completely cover up another card. So this game's all about tucking cards under other cards to build the city, which I think is fascinating. Now, scoring is based on all kinds of things, like who has the biggest residential area or what, whatever your biggest residential area is. Um, consuming those resources I mentioned, uh, you get extra points for lakes, but if they're only one size, they're worth nothing. But for every one past that, they're worth three. Uh, the, the scoring is the most complicated part of this game. Now, there is a follow-up to this game called Hokkaido that I've heard is even better. But it's still on my pile of shame due to the copy I have missing all the resource cubes. And I keep meaning to pull out my copy of Honshu and see if they're compatible, if I can just steal the cubes from the others. And honestly, if this is half as good as Honshu, I can easily recommend it. Like, I'd, I'd almost want to say Hokkaido should be on this list, but I haven't played it. So check out either of them. And hopefully in the next couple of weeks, I've actually I reread the rules for Hokkaido, and it does a neat thing where there's a mountain in the middle. And then you have to split all your stuff, and you only score your lowest your smallest version so like your city split by this mountain and only your smaller of your two city scores so you have to try to balance each side of the mountain sounds really good oh and that was honshu and possibly its follow-up hokkaido up next i want to go back into the party game realms with something pretty close to the new hotness here something we don't always talk about on the tabletop Elva. that is medium this one is great due to handling two to eight players Though with eight, you may want to play until you're bored instead of playing a full game because it may take a lot longer than you'd expect. Now, in medium, you and the player on your left each draw a card, read the word on the card out loud, word or words, on the card out loud, and then on a three count, say the word that's the medium between the two words. This is something that both of the words have in common. And you're both saying this at once. And of course, you're going to say the same word, right? 
Well, if you fail, you try again, but now you're using the words you just said. And if you don't get it this time, you get one more chance with those words. And then you score points based on making matches. So if you were able to make a match, a, a connection, a psychic connection with the player on your left, you get some points. This, I am surprised by how well this game plays. I, I would say it's almost an intimate experience playing two players. A great game for date night as well as a good card game, filler card game. Absolutely. I just comedy at every turn during this game yes. you, you can't keep a straight face for long during medium again that was medium next i have ratuki this is a rather old card game that was recently reprinted by the op this is a real-time ladder climbing game where players are playing cards from their hand into a number of growing decks in the center of the table now every deck has to start at one but every card played after that has to be one higher or one lower than the card that's currently on the top of one of the decks now when you play a five onto a stack you say retuki and you claim that whole stack of cards after everyone's played all the cards they can you count up the cards you've claimed now, the game does include a scoring system where you're meant to play multiple rounds, kind of like playing hearts where you're aiming for 200 eventually, but you can just play a single round. And that's where this is a perfect filler is you just keep playing rounds of Ratuki until you're ready to start the other game or the other game table finishes up. And that is Ratuki. Now, jumping back to new games, I have the Hidden Gem Scora. Except for a few reviewers I know who got copies of this, I don't not see anyone talking about this game, and it's a shame. This is a Viking-themed card set collection game with a fishing theme that features some really striking artwork. Everyone that sees pictures I share of this is like, ooh, what game is that? I love the cards. Now, Scora is an interesting mix of take that set collection and area control that plays lightning fast. Like, we're talking 15 minutes or under, not half an hour. It's actually one of the shortest fillers on our list tonight, but actually features surprisingly deep gameplay for a game that plays so quickly. And I strongly check, recommend checking out our Scora review to learn more. And that was Scora. Speaking of games with striking looking cards, next I've got Lotus. This is a game about making flowers featuring some of the best looking flower card art I've ever seen. Every card features one petal of a flower type, and when played, you put it on top of the other cards already in play to make a complete flower. And then, while completing flowers is a big part of the game, this is actually an area control game where the player with the most control points gain all the cards in the completed flower. Note, that may not necessarily be the person who played the last card on the flower. This is actually a surprisingly deep game, which again is very accessible because of the theme. It's, it's easy to get non-gamers to play it. It's like, oh, it's a game about building flowers. And the scoring really isn't all that complicated. And that was Lotus. All right, we're nearing the end. Um, it ends up, I did this unintentionally, but I got a string of games here with great artwork because that's the last three. I have some of the best looking art I've seen in card games. And the next one is Kodama the tree spirits by daniel solis this is a game with artwork that looks like it's ripped right out of a studio ghibli movie it's a drafting game where players are growing trees and scoring points for connecting branches with different elements on them now the brilliant part in this game is the players start the game with a number of scoring cards in their hand and every season out of four seasons you have to score one of them so this leads to a really high level of long-term planning and strategy of when, what scores, what cards you want to score when. Now, I will admit, I've had mixed results with this one as far as non-gamers are concerned. Some people get it right away, some don't. Now, the majority of people are willing to sit down and figure it out and play twice in a row once they get it, because it usually takes one game to get it, due to the unique theme and the whole, oh, I built this really cool-looking tree and that Ghibli-like artwork. And that was Kodama, the Tree Spirits. My last game on the list, I actually added when I was collecting games for our backdrop, and that was Dead Man's Draw. This is actually my all-time favorite push-your-luck game. The Rallyman GT may beat it out now that I've been playing more rounds of that. Very different style of push-your-luck game, though. I actually quite some coil numbers up there, too. All right, before I play these modern games, as far as card games go, this was, for a long time, my favorite push-your-luck game. Um, you're drawing cards from a central deck. So everyone's drawing from the same deck. You're going to flip up the top card and do whatever it says. Well, it doesn't say anything. It's got a symbol on it. It's all, it's, it's language independent. And then it's going to, the cards you flip up, is going to do things like let you draw more cards, like draw three cards and pick one to play or remove a card from the, the card row, I think is what we said they're called. 
the uh, card, card line. Row, card line. The card line. Sorry, remove a card from the card line, or take a card from your person and put it in your personal tableau, or steal a card from other players. There's all kinds of I can't remember the number of different cards. There's like nine different types of cards in this game. And then once you've done it, you then have to decide: do you draw again? And if you draw again, you again do the effect on the card. You can keep doing that. The problem is at any point you can stop. You're like, I'm done. I'm good. And you just collect all the cards in the card line and they go in your tableau and there's a scoring system for that. But if you choose to push your luck and if you draw a single duplicate card of any that are already up there, you bust and you get nothing. And there's also cracking cards. And if you draw a cracking card, you also instantly bust. Now, if you like push your luck schemes at all, you need to own this game. Like everyone who loves quick playing, fast playing, push your luck, like Oh, I don't know if I'm going to, you know, that feeling when you're flipping a card, you love this game. It's a fantastic push your luck game. And that was Dead Man's Draw. All right. I do have four honorable mentions that I thought I needed to bring up tonight. Um, so we're going to go through those pretty quickly. I got a little bit to say about them and I'll note, it, note why were they were not on the list. And there are a variety of reasons. Up first, I've got just one. This is a party game that people love. This takes the usual person gives a clue and everyone has to guess and turns it on its head where one person has to guess and everyone gives the clue. Except if anyone gives the same clue as someone else, it gets wiped out and can't be used. That just sounds brilliant. I have heard so many good things about this game. And the only reason it's not on the list is I haven't actually had the chance to play this game. But that was just one. Next is one I'll probably get some feedback for, and that is Love Letter. Uh, this is an extremely popular card game that only features 18 cards and some scoring tokens. It kind of took the gaming world by storm. Um, it spawned a number of variations and intimidations, some of which people seem to like more than others. The thing is, I haven't really enjoyed any version of Love Letter all that much. It's okay. I get the game. I just don't find it all that fun. I think the main thing is that it's supposed to be a bluffing game. And to play it well, people have to bluff. And I've played it with people who play it mechanically. And I'm not a huge fan of bluffing games in the first place. So I'm putting it on the honorable mentions because so many other people out there love love a letter. It may work for you, but I am not a fan of it. Yeah, and uh, so that was Love Letter, which uh, I'm going to find point out, talk about later in some to some degree. Top, one of the top 40 games in the world at some point. Yes, at one there point. you go. See, I told you it was popular. Uh, the fact that Love Letter leads to bluffing leads me to my next game because that is Coup, which is a game that also requires bluffing. I've said many times in the show, I don't really like social deduction games. And well, Coup is a pretty pure social deduction game. Now, I will say, of all the social deduction games I played, especially the ones that are based on Werewolf, this was my favorite, but it's still really not my kind of game. This is a hidden role game where players select teams to go on missions, except some of the players are spies, they're saboteurs, and they're there to screw things up. And the whole goal is for the non-saboteurs to figure out who the saboteurs are and manage to complete a set number of missions before the game ends. And while the spies are there to make sure that doesn't happen. Uh, this is definitely like, it, it, it spawned from the need for Werewolf or Mafia that's shorter and doesn't need a moderator. And I think it succeeds brilliantly at that. It's just not my kind of game. And that was Coop. Final game on my list is Saboteur, and based on what I just said about Coup, you can easily guess why this game didn't make the main list. Uh, this is another hidden wool game with a lot of backstabbing. Um, I thought it meant to be mentioned here because it's very popular, especially here in Windsor. I don't know how popular Saboteur is anywhere else gaming, but I have seen so many games of this being played. I know Sean, he's even played it on Board Game Arena. I have some friends that love this game about dwarves exploring a gem mine and trying to suss out who's the saboteur who's just looking to collapse the mines and get away with everything on their own just not a fan of that style of game but it's popular and i wanted to mention it in case you do dig that style of play and i would personally recommend not playing it on board game arena despite my love of board game arena uh i too have not enjoyed saboteur digitally at least but that was saboteur and that's it for our list of great filler card games today now we're going to head over to the lobby and see if anyone in our chat room has questions or further suggestions.
All right, lobbyists, now that you've heard what we were able to come up with, what do you have to add? And I've seen quite a chat here. Yeah, it's awesome. There's on. some great stuff going on in the chat room tonight. I got to say, next time we do one of these, I got to give a couple to you. That was a lot of me talking. In Sorry. Room. Yeah, no, I should I should have pulled some of those over. Your, your I should have gave you a love letter and you your, your, go voice, and... your voice was rough already yeah, that, uh, tonight. That was that was bad for that me. That was I'm a sorry. lot of talking. Well, my other problem was the list was 21. And then I went downstairs to grab them for the, the backdrop. And I was like, oh, Dead Man's Draw. <laughs> oh, Medium. Like, why didn't I think of these games? Once I'm actually looking at my games, I right. was like, I got to throw these on the list. And I actually cut some out, like the Fox in the Forest. And I totally forgot to edit today. Took out the Fox so in the Forest. So one of the, I'm scrolling back here. One of our first questions is, uh, Board Games and Bourbon wants to know, would the Grizzled be considered a card game? Yes, it's definitely a card game, but I wouldn't call it a filler because it tends to take longer than half an hour. And so that was my limit. I probably should have said that at the top that my limit here were games that could be played in half an hour or less. That's what I went with for to, to help reduce my options. Right. Now, if I was just talking about great card games, the Grizzled would be here. Or great cooperative card games, the Grizzled would be here. Meaningful card games, the Grizzled. Ga card games with great art, the Grizzled. But for fillers, I'm going to see what BGA says for, uh, or BGG says for time on that one. Uh, next, while you're checking that, Jeff yeah. came in with a classic card games that don't suck list with I, Oh Hell, I, We Could Do That, Beat the Landlord, and Ricochet Poker. I haven't, I think I played Oh Hell. <laughs> um, no, I personally, I love hearts. Like, I, my favorite traditional card game is hearts. I love the ability to screw people by giving them hearts, and I love the ability to try to shoot the moon if you're behind. Now, Board Games and Bourbon jumps in again with a Believe it or not, a trick-taking game I haven't heard you mention, and that okay. is Spookra, which is a take on Euchre, but it's a haunted house sort of uh, Euchre uh, game. All right. So and it's one a, I have played it's a recent is one. from Steve Jackson games called Spooks, which is a Euchre variant that uses Halloween-themed suits, but there are six suits instead of four. I have played Spooks, which is S-P-O-O-K-S, but not Spookra. So Spookra is... Uh, S P O O K R E from 2018, uh, published by da, 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 Twitch Factory. All right, they should send us a review copy. We review tons <laughs> of, of of trick taking games here. Somehow, in the last like, 2019, I think we did a whole slew of trick taking games unintentionally. Uh, and Jeff is jumping in with a for sale is effing fantastic. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> it is. It's a really good game. Uh, and and it's Monopoly, not hard to understand. Monopoly Deal is another one that uh, popped. I, I have up. heard so many know. good things about it. Neither that. one of us have played it. And no. I tried buying it last Black Friday, and the Amazon locked up, and I could not, it would not let me buy it. Uh, it was one of those things where I could get it for like a buck fifty or something with all the deals, and it would yeah. not let me do it. All right, so the Grizzled on Board Game Geek is listed at 30 minutes. Now, the Armistice Advantage ed Edition that adds campaign play is listed at longer. So, yes, it probably could have been on this list. And to be honest, I will definitely throw it in uh, once we do the show notes, once I do the blog version, I'll probably toss the grizzled in there. So one I did cut from the list was Lost City. So probably, like I said, I had the list and then I added some stuff and took some stuff off. And the two I took off, which I'll list here while we're doing the lobby, which may or may not end up in the full episode. Who knows? Depends how brilliant you folk are in the <laughs> lobby or if we unintentionally swear um, is the Fox in the Forest. The main reason I took it off is I'm getting sick of talking about the Fox in the Forest. I don't mean that in a bad way, but like it's like every game list we have lately, we mention the Fox in the Forest. And it's kind of like everyone who listened to us knows we like the Fox in the Forest. So I'm throwing that out for that reason. Plus, it's two-player only. And the only time two-player filler games, like, like how often when you have date night, you need a filler game. Like maybe that's what you want to play. But that to me is only for those cases where you got a game night happening in a public play event and two new people show up. And I stop teaching whatever game I'm playing and quickly teach some Fox in the Forest so that they have something to do while we wrap up. And that's the only place it kind of fits. And the other game I had was Lost Cities, which is the old Rainier Nitzia classic, for the exact same reason. It was two-player only. So I dropped it off the list because it's niche of a niche. Though, honestly, I wanted to keep it on the list because I made a cute pun because we used to use that to fill Deanna's lunch time when she worked at the library. I would meet her downtown, and we would go to Ron Bala's The Coffee Exchange downtown. Great coffee shop, better gamer and play Lost Cities to fill the time on our lunch break. So it literally was a filler for us. 
Uh, next up, another uh, suggestion from Board Games in Bergen. While you were talking about Arboretum, they mentioned uh, in the same vein Village Green, which is a brand yep. new 2020 from uh, Osprey Games. Now, Village Green, if I remember, is a retheme of. Well, it's not listed as a retheme. No? No. I'm thinking of Fields of Green then. Mm. Okay, yeah, I'm thinking of something else then. I am I Village Green. I no, I've never even seen that game. Yeah, no, it's that, it's, that it's just new. goes I mean, it's, to the show. And and I was I was pointed out in the chat it, with only three hundred and seventy eight ratings. It came out during the pandemic, so it's going to be one yeah. of those sleepers that someone's going to have to to push big. So hey, oh, Osprey Games, if you want to come to yeah. send us a copy. <clears throat> Osprey Games doesn't even do cons. Like like uh, you don't you don't you right. can't go to the Osprey booth at Origins and check out Gaslands. Like they're they're such a weird company for publishing. So no, that's that's worth checking out. Again, we'll throw that in the show notes once we get that finalized. But no, I have definitely not played played this. Uh, Tech is pointing out uh, we love Point Salad and a little card game called Take the Gold. Now Point Salad, I have heard fantastic things about that. That one's supposed to be way up there. That was one that either came out just pre-pandemic or shortly after, and I just I missed it. Right, I missed the window to try that one out. So that's probably a good recommendation. I wouldn't be able to put it on the list because I haven't played it. Uh, and then we've got uh, Will Wheaton convince board games and bourbon that Batman Love Letter is uh, the way is to the go. One to get. <laughs> I've heard the Batman one that at least has some unique twists. Of all the ones I played, my favorite was called um, Hefe was in it. And it was about luchador wrestling. And there were little belts that came with, oh, what, El Hefe? Hefe. It's, it's a love letter clone where you're trying, you played your wrestlers and your managers. I don't even remember how to spell F.A. <laughs> I, know, I know that's how it's pronounced. It's one of the words I know. Uh, what is that game called? That was actually really good. And I also like one called Cypher. Oh, that's gotten interesting things. Okay, don't try typing F.A. love letter. <laughs> uh, it meant the boss. So El Jefe, something right. like that. But it was about luchador wrestling. And it used the sort of the love letter thing. But again, with a, the very limited number of cards. Uh, board Game is Bourbon is saying, I want to learn to love Board Game Arena, but every time he does, it feels like those claw games in a carnival. He leaves thinking, I guess this would be fun in real life. I Personally, for me, it is my number one source of board gaming, uh, particularly in the pandemic. So that's that's why I have become a huge BGA fan, fanboy almost uh, yeah. at this point. I cannot find copies of this game. It and came in the drawstream Jeff. bag. Hmm? Uh, Jeff's just heading out. Oh, you don't want to hear the the great review coming up <laughs> after the coffee break? Uh, and a uh, splendor like game called Bees. I've heard uh, that's good. That's not a card game, though, is it? Uh, I don't know. And then uh, Age of War is another uh, accessible filler. Uh, that's stuff. more of a dice game than yeah. a card game. So I get it. I like the game. But to me, like, yes, you have cards, but it's all about rolling the dice and filling the cards. It's the same reason Roll For It didn't make the list, because Roll For It, while it has cards, is much more about rolling those dice to get them to place it. Age of War is a really neat samurai-themed game, and I agree. It's it's a solid game, but it, it was purposely left off this list, because I think it's definitely more of a dice game than a card game. Right. All right, well, that uh, that wraps up what we've got here in the lobby tonight for our ask. And no luck on Hefe. I'm still looking. It's bugging me. <laughs> I, I can't believe I can't find this game. Like, does it Luka, not exist? Lucador, uh, Luchador, Mexican wrestling dice? I No, there's no dice. <laughs> card game. All right. Remember, if you got a game or game night question for us, head over to the website. Click on Ask the Bellhop. Today, we're going to take a look at Techlandia, a game that mixes tech blogging, big corporations, and the lovecraft mythos before i begin we do have to note that we were sent a review copy of this game all right i also want to say right now straight up i can save you all a bunch of time you can stop right here skip ahead to the next segment find another one of our videos to watch go do something else this game is not good this isn't an enjoyable board game it's rather more of a joke a uh, tongue-in-cheek look at tech journalism a uh, form of social commentary, perhaps. Or maybe it's just trying to prove a point about Kickstarter. Or more likely, it's all of the above. 
what it isn't is a good game. If you are curious, though, feel free to stick around. Otherwise, see you later. YouTube has timestamps you can jump around with down below. Still here? Nice. All right. Techlandia was designed by Dan Eckerman, a well-known tech journalist who started off as a radio DJ, moved on to blogging, and eventually became an editor at CNET. He's also a published author with one nonfiction book under his belt, The Tetris Effect, the game that hypnotized the world. With Technolandia now published by 11231 Games just last year, Dan now gets to list published game designer and successful Kickstarter runner to his list of accolades. So as a tech geek myself, I knew of Dan from his contributions to CNET and This Week in Technology Podcast Network. So I was shocked to hear that it was that Dan Ackerman's name on the box. And I admit, it did up my interest in this project. For better or, well, nah, just worse. Right, Tiflanda is a competitive dungeon crawling board game for one to four players. In Techlandia, you are a tech blogger who's attempting to crash a cell phone launch event at the fastest growing tech company in the world, Techlandia. As uninvited guests, the bloggers will attempt to find four QR codes that they can present to security to allow them entry into the keynote event. To do this, they'll have to investigate four rooms and use their gear to deal with Techlandia's various tech cultists and hopefully attain some decryption codes along the way while avoiding losing their objectivity and becoming a dreaded fanboy. Can one of the bloggers make it past security before the definitely not a doomsday clock runs out? For a look at exactly what you get in this box, check out our Techlandia unboxing video on YouTube. Note there is a custom playmat available for sale on their website, but that was not part of the Kickstarter at all. And as a result, not something we received. Now, I got to say the physical quality of the components in this game is good. There's only one punch board. It punched easy enough. The plastic stands actually hold the standees really well. Like they were easy to get in and didn't damage the cardboard at all. Everything fit back into the blocks. Uh, even the standees, I didn't have to take them off. Big bonus there. Uh, the number of cards in this game are good quality, though some are really strangely large, but I guess it works. Now, where all this falls apart is the graphic design and artwork in this game. Now, this game was kickstarted, as Sean mentioned, and made over $12,000 U.S., and based on what you get in the box, I got to say none or very little of that money was spent on artwork. Every card in this game, every card type in this game has one piece of artwork for it. 30 different gear cards all have a picture of a book on them. 20 encounter cards, all with the exact same art. 10 investigation cards with a picture of a door. That's it. Sick tech cultist standees, all identical. A bunch of enemy cards, all the same corporate drone with the Cthulhu head guy. Now, I got to say, the art they did get is decent. Like, it looks good. It, it's it's fine. And actually, when Deanna flipped over her first few cards, like, oh, the art in this game's pretty good. And I said, well, wait till you flip over the next card. And you just see the same thing over and over again. There's just not enough art in this game. Like, even Monopoly has different line art on the chance cards. Come on. Now, if you did back the Kickstarter, you get STL files for upgraded components and even a box insert if you happen to have a 3D printer and want to spend <laughs> time and materials on them. You just don't get them without effort. I also note that the print and play version is free right now on their website as of this recording. Well, that's interesting to know. So first off, the STL files, I gotta admit, I wish more companies would do this. Please give me free STLs to improve my games. That is a great idea. Give me the STL for a box insert for backing your Kickstarter. I dig it. I also think it's kind of funny because, well, dude's obviously a tech blogger and into high tech things and just assumes everyone who buys his game has a 3D printer. Maybe that's a little loss of touch with reality there. Maybe he's taking a hit to his objectivity. Um, what I do think is interesting, though, is the print and play is free. Because this was a independent backer level on the Kickstarter that was more than, say, a buck. Like, uh, it was actually $8 US to get the print and play. And I do wonder if there's any bitter backers out there that are annoyed that now anyone could get this for free. Uh, it's a temporary, it, it, it's listed as a temporary thing. So I don't know, okay, I don't know how long it's been temporary for. But all, all right. right. So, how do you put these components to use? Give us a summary of how to play Techlandia. 
right, you start Technol India by building the map. Uh, you got four set locations and four random locations. Now, the game comes with enough tiles to have actually 24 different possible room combinations, which is great for replayability if anyone actually really wanted to replay this game. Next, you pick a tech blogger to play, which just is a matter of picking which standee you want to use. You grab this cell phone dashboard card, which is how you track some stuff. I thought it was cute. It was a cell phone, I guess. On that card, you're going to pick one of three skills that you're an expert at. Uh, the skills are spyware, disinformation, or memes. Now, the various card decks are shuffled. The cube's paced on the 20 spot of the definitely not a doomsday clock, which I'm just going to start calling doomsday clock. Uh, the story deck's stacked, so it goes in a certain order. Um, you put your standees in the welcome center, and you draw five gear cards. Now, every game of Techmandia starts by someone reading off the background information from the rulebook, followed by reading the first of those story cards. Now, I'm not going to spoil the story here, but the flavor text is really well written, if a little bit snarky, and it gets everyone into the theme of the game, which is basically corporate greed meets Lovecraftian horror. Well, the writing in the game isn't bad. In fact, it's even really good in some places. Mm -hmm. It's a low humor. The game has a habit of dunking on tech and geek tropes, flaunting the author's superiority against folks that work in the industry for better or worse. And yeah, this is not a game that pushes other people up. <laughs> Now, the goal of Techlandia is for the bloggers to investigate the four locations in the headquarters, find four QR codes, present them to security, and get in the elevator before the timer runs out. Now, players will also want to defeat a few enemies along the way just to improve their odds of picking the right QR code. Now, each turn, players are going to get two actions. There's a bunch of different actions, and I'm going to explain each of them. Really simple, the first one is move. Move your blogger one hex on the map. More complicated is investigator room. Draw an investigation card and do what it says. Now, this is a 10 card deck that's split evenly between success and failure cards. Now, success cards will have you place a QR code somewhere on the map. Failure cards will force you to draw an encounter card and do what it says on that and may provide an additional penalty if the hex you're in is red and half the rooms are red, half are blue. Red rooms represent high security rooms. Thematic enough, I guess. Now, encounter cards do a variety of things. They can spawn enemies, they can force you to move, they can make you lose gear, give gear to other players. This is actually a significant deck of different encounters. Now, once you successfully investigate a room, you're going to mark that on your dashboard because part of the game is you have to successfully investigate all four rooms. Even if you've already acquired the key code, QR codes, you've got to do that before you can move on to the next stage of the game. Speaking of the QR codes, one of the actions is to pick one up. So if there's one placed on the map and you're in the room with it, you can pick it up. Now, while in the end of the game, there are real QR codes to scan that do require a cell phone. Mm -hmm. The tokens apparently are sadly not even joke codes. Like they don't just bring you to, to you know, something silly. They just don't scan at all, which I think is no. a real missed opportunity. Like one of these so should have been a Rickroll. <laughs> like I, I, I'm kind of I was shocked you couldn't scan these. Now, your next option are, has to do with those enemies. You fight a tech cultist. If you ever find yourself in a room with an enemy and have actions left, you have to fight that enemy. Now, to do this, you start by flipping over the top enemy card to find out exactly what you're going to fight. Um, these each have a skill they're susceptible to at the bottom based on those three skills I mentioned before and a target number. If you happen to have the appropriate skill, you're going to roll your D6, you add one. If you don't have the skill, you don't add anything. If you roll equal to or higher than the target number, you defeat the enemy, you remove them from the map, you gain one description code. No, you can only have three of these, so defeating more than three enemies earns you nothing. And then finally, the enemy card is placed back on the bottom of the deck. So the rules even suggest in their tongue-in-cheek manner that if you're still fighting after three wins, you're doing it wrong. Yes. Now, if you are defeated, you're escorted to the welcome center, the, the start tile. You lose one point of objectivity. Now, objectivity is your hate points, basically. Hate points? Hit points. Um, you start with three points. If you lose all your objectivity, you've fallen for the hype and become a Techlandia fanboy. And now work against the other players. Well, work against them still, but in a different way. Um, I, I thought that was kind of neat and thematic. Um, you only stay a fanboy, though, until the doomsday clock hits a red number. And there's like every five or so is a red number. At that point, you shake your head and regain your senses. Now, this is also actually a kind of an awesome mechanic. Far yeah. too many journalists do applaud and cheer tech releases as fans when they're supposed to be impartially covering the release of them. Uh, and this, this sort of really kind of shows that nicely. 
Yeah, this is definitely one of one of the the things I will definitely prop up about this game is the whole fanboy mechanic is very well done and very thematic. Now, what the game fails to tell you is what to do with that standee and that enemy card. So to us, when we were playing, it just made sense that the enemy would stay there because part of the game would be if we just put them away when you lose, there wouldn't be enough for people to get decryption codes. So it seemed pretty obvious the standee would stay there, but then what do you do with the enemy card? Because nothing said to do anything with it. So it made sense that that same enemy would still be in that room because they weren't defeated. Now, the problem with this is all the standees are identical. They're not tied at all to the card, and there's no way to indicate which card belongs with which. Now, at the beginning of the game, this is probably pretty simple, right? You don't have to worry about it. They're near each other. But, like, once you get four or five enemies on the map, it can be confusing. Now, maybe we should have removed the standee. I don't think so, though. Or perhaps put the card on the bottom of the deck like you do when you win. I don't know, because it wasn't in the rules. Yeah, nor, nor was it mentioned in the clarifications by the designer on Board Game Geek. That's strange. Next option on your turn. Excuse me. Next option on your turn is to reload your gear. You do this in the press room. Well, there you can use an action to draw a gear card. You can hold up the seven of these, and all of these break the rules in some way in your favor. They can do a variety of things, like allow you to move yourself or an enemy or another player, or give you rerolls on dice, instantly defeat an enemy, get objectivity back, and so on. Finally, we have submitting a QR code to security. Once you've investigated four rooms and you have four QR codes, you can submit a code to security. You shuffle the deck of four QR code cards. These are different than the tokens. And you flip it up and you scan it with your actual phone and learn if it's a good or a bad code. Now, if it's a bad code, boom, alarms go off. You're arrested, eliminated from the game. Womp, womp. That is unless you have decryption codes from defeating enemies. Each decryption code gives you one more chance to scan another code. And if you've done the math, if you have three decryption codes, you just get it eventually because there's only four cards. Each code gives you one or more chance to scan another code. Eventually, you're going to get the right code. Now all you have to do is get to the elevator and you win the game. Simple enough, assuming you can make sense of the missing rules. Or at least come up with some kind of house rule to keep it going. Now, after each round, the doomsday clock, sorry, the not a doomsday clock, advances one space. And when it hits certain numbers, you're going to read another card off the story deck. Now, as time goes on, the story evolves. There's a growing number of penalties that start being applied to the players and special enemies might show up. And if no one has made it to the elevator before the clock reaches zero, you get to read the final card and learn how the world ends. So it doesn't seem too bad. And that, I admit, is exactly what I thought upon sitting down and reading the rules for this game. Like, there's some interesting sounding concepts here. Uh, the entire idea of a modern, like, 19, or sorry, 2020, where are you, 19, I almost went in the past there, 2020s game of sneaking around to tech HQ and searching for codes and using your various high-tech gear to avoid conflict or defeat or try to defeat corporate drones sounds really neat and i love the whole becoming a fanboy and then hindering the other players and when you hinder them what you actually do is you move to their square and you get in their face and you're supposed to tell them how awesome techlandia is which i gotta admit will lead to some role playing with the right groups and then the only way to get rid of them is to escort them back to the the welcome center you can't punch them or anything because fanboys are just harmless they're just annoying I, I thought that was really cool. And I got to say, the story is pretty well done. It's entertaining, engaging. I kind of want to know more. The writing, while a bit punchy and derogatory at times, is really solid, which makes sense. The game was designed by a writer, first and foremost. The entire concept of this game is solid. But I, the problem is it just doesn't work. Like The actual gameplay in Techlandia is so highly random to just be frustrating and boring and then added to that is that whole lack of artwork i mentioned earlier you hear you have this great theme and this great story with no nothing to show for it no artwork like those doomsday cards you flip them and you read them and it's just a big block of text like not having artwork for this just does a terrible disservice to the entire theme and story like how can you have such a great story and not use artwork to flesh that out yeah, and I really want to point out something else here as well. On the Kickstarter, Dan pointed out some concepts that he really wanted to achieve in making this game. One of, one of them was the use of some of his favorite mechanics as a board game player himself. Uh, and hex tile based map, interesting mm -hmm. characters, fast combat, strategy, and exploration. Now, 
there is no reason for using hexes in this game. None at all. It makes no difference whether it's a hex or a square, the way things are laid out. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the characters are interchangeable, completely interchangeable, aside yeah. from flavor text on there, the card you get to know who you are. Now, I will admit the combat is absolutely fast, <laughs> and there is technically strategy and exploration in a manner of speaking. I don't know, it's tactics maybe. Strategy implies long-term planning and planning moves ahead. I didn't really get that from Techlandia. And I don't know, maybe the version you played had flavor text, but there's nothing for the characters. All you pick is a standee. It's based on how you look, and that's it. Uh, in the in the rulebook, there is a character description of each of the characters. Oh, I missed that? Okay. I mean, I'd, I'd have to I'd have to double-check my rulebook. So I, I thought, missed that. I'm sorry, so I thought bad. it was a card, but I know for a fact... There is a, a character backstory blurb in the in the rule book. Okay, I did miss the different character backstories. That's my bad for reading the game and not playing it like the same night. Fair enough. So there's a little bit more story there. The thing is, you're going to spend most of your time in this game moving into one of those hex rooms and trying to investigate it and probably failing over and over and over again. Our first, and I'll admit only, game Dana managed to fail in her investigation 10 times in a row. All 10 times she failed on the same card. The same event happened 10 times. And failing over and over like this is not fun. But like, not only is it not fun for Deanna or the, whoever it happened to, it holds up the game for everyone else. Because without someone succeeding, you don't generate any QR codes. And yes, QR codes can be picked up by other players, but Deanna managed to pick up one of mine, so I couldn't get the four until she happened to succeed at one point. Like, that may sound like a neat mechanic, but it's not. And then with all these features, the board filled up. Well, like failures, sorry, with all these failures, with 10 failures in a row, every time she failed, we're putting more standees out. And the board just filled with tech cultists. And that's where we ran into the issue of not knowing what to do with the enemy cards. We're like, wait a minute. Like, we even looked online for an answer and found nothing. Like, our table was cluttered with these large enemy cards, and we kept saying, wait, wait, which standee was him? Was, was that that one? Was that the intern? Or was that the, the Jargon Gorgon, right? And and we thought of actually using the, the room cards, because you have location cards and putting on the enemies, but then we had two enemies in the same room. It was just a mess. Yeah, I voted for slipping them back into the deck, but the fact is, the rules just don't say. No, they don't. I would say for ease of play, just put them in the bottom. Uh, go with the fact they're corporate drones and you're running into a different corporate drone who happens to be in the room. They're patrolling the room with someone. I don't know. Now, the biggest problem with this investigation system that it's literally binary, yes or no, and it's a perfect 50-50 split. When you draw a card, you have an equal chance of success or failure. And when done, success or failure, you shuffle the card back in. So the odds never change. And what I really dislike about this is that it's completely arbitrary, 100%. There is no player agency here. There is no better way to investigate or prepare to investigate or work together to investigate. Now, there are some gear cards that modify die rolls, but there's no dice rolls during an investigation. And now, he... <laughs> getting to dice rolls, that's when we get to the combat system. And to be honest, it can be just as bad, if not worse, due to the fact that most of the enemies need a roll of five or higher on a D6. That's not good odds. That's worse than 50-50. Though at least here, many of the gear cards can help you out and mitigate that randomness. So in a way, maybe it's better because you just have to make sure you have the right gear. Uh, it's so random. And here's where things get amusing. Yeah, so this is really interesting. And I think this is where some of the problems we found lie. There is a Tabletopia version of Techlandia out there that doesn't seem to be promoted anywhere, but you can get to it from the original Kickstarter page. Now, both Sean and I checked this out before I played my physical copy, and I was going to sit down and play a game with him, but I was completely lost because it is based on an older beta version of the game. And in that version of the game, there was a lot more things based on die rolls, one of them being the investigation system. Back then, you rolled a D6 when you investigated. If you rolled even, you succeeded, and if you rolled odd, you had a failure. Where at least under that system, the gear cards that modify dice would actually help you mitigate the randomness of an investigation. And it's like they forgot to update the cards. Because this change from dice base to card base led to other problems. 
during our game, we drew an encounter card that says, roll the die. On a success, do this. On a failure, do that. And we had to stop because in the production retail copy of this game, there is nothing in the rules that tells you how to determine this success. Now, having seen the beta with Sean, we assume that even with success, odd was a failure. But I don't think anyone picking this game up off store shelves is going to realize there was a beta version somewhere on Tabletopia. So they're going to have no idea what to do with this card. Yeah, it's backers of the Kickstarter were supposed to have access to a Tabletopia version of the game, even at the $1 level. But this link on the Kickstarter page is the only mention of the online version, and it's barely playable and only as a solo experience. It doesn't even have, even though it's got all the the parts, <laughs> it's I not even try set that. for a dual a two-player experience. So strange. So overall, what you've got here is a game with an amusing, fairly tongue-in-cheek story that has some interesting concepts that unfortunately were all executed poorly. The theme is great, but it's wasted on boring, random, repetitive gameplay. What Techlandy really reminds me of actually is the Labyrinth board game. Um, back when I reviewed that game, which you can find on the blog or even on YouTube, I talked about how my biggest disappointment with the Jim Hansen's Labyrinth board game is that it's so close to being a decent game. Like it's almost there. They have some really neat ideas where for teamwork and for grouping different skills and using dice for skills. And Techlandia feels the exact same way to me because just with some more development and some more play testing, I think this could have been a good, if not great game. Like to me, it's just, it's such a waste that it didn't get to the next level that it just feels like it was thrown out there. It's like a waste of what's a really cool concept and theme. Yeah, I'm sorry to say, Dan, but all your excellent writing, the fancy marketing, previews, uh, just don't make this an enjoyable game. Yeah, I'm sorry to say, I can't recommend this game to anyone. Like, I, I can see people out there being like, oh, you like Dan Ackerman, you subscribe to whatever magazine, or you listen to his podcast, I'm going to get you his game as a joke. And I got to say, no, not even then. Like, I, I can't even recommend it as a gag gift. Well, Techlandia features a great concept, a very cool theme, and has a well-written and entertaining story, the lack of artwork and lack of gameplay. Like, it's just not there to support uh, the, the theming here. I... <sighs> I'm, I'm extrapolating here. I'm theorizing. I wonder if creating a good game wasn't Dan's goal at all. Like perhaps Dan just wanted to prove you could publish anything on Kickstarter with the right amount of clout because he has it, right? He had the platform. And maybe this is a, is a statement about Kickstarter. Or perhaps this isn't meant to be a game, but a social commentary on the world of tech journalism. And in that way, that could be like CO2 Second Chance, where um, the designer made a statement on climate change by making an almost unwinnable game. Maybe Dan just wanted to add to his resume and say, I am a published game designer and I ran a successful Kickstarter. Whatever Dan's goals were, if any of them were about making a fun, playable game, he failed. If for some reason you actually want a bit more information about Techlandia, you can check out the written review over at tabletopbellhop.com. And now the Bellhops Tabletop, where we look back at games we played since last episode. More actual physical gaming. That's two weeks in a row. I got actual physical games to talk about, not just board game arena. I love it. We got to keep it up. We got to get another gaming night in this weekend, and then we can keep talking about actual games. So up first, Deanne and I played a couple more rounds of the Quacks of Quedlinburg. Uh, we're still enjoying this game, though Deanne has determined she's terrible at it. Uh, she's yet to win, so I have won every game of Quacks. What? So <laughs> I, I think she pushes her luck at the wrong time, or I don't know. It, it is not going well. It, it could be work. It could could be uh, luck based, but I don't think so because that's my whole point about this game is it's not nearly as luck based as I thought it was. Unlike Dead Man's Draw, we were talking about earlier, it's up to you when you push your luck. Now our first game, we decided to try the two bookmark version of all the ingredients, and wow. Does that ever change the game? Like it changes what you buy, when you want to buy it, how much you want of each ingredient. And it totally changes the odds of exploding and drawing things from your pot. Like it's significant. Now, one of the big things the two side does is reduces your ability to mitigate your chance of exploding in any way. 
Uh, you no longer have the yellow mandrake ingredient that lets you put cherry bombs back into the bag. It's replaced by a different yellow ingredient. And you no longer have the blue one that lets you draw multiple chips and pick which one. So there's just way more chances you are going to draw cherry bombs and possibly blow up. Now, instead, there are new blue chips that have it so that when your pot does explode, you still get both points of money to spend. So all you're losing out on is the potential to roll the die roll. The other thing that was a big change in the game is there's a lot less ways to get rubies on the two sides. So what that meant is no thickening the pot, which is the moving your water token up in your pot. But if you haven't played the game, I realize it probably doesn't make a lot of sense to you. But, oh, wow, did it change. Like, like, I wouldn't say it felt like playing a new game. It was still quacks, but there was a significant difference from playing with the ones and the twos. And and now I'm just getting more and more sad that because of this wonderful world we live in right now, I can't get down there uh, and play it as I had been hoping would have happened. Yeah, we we need to play. You need to play this one. I am really surprised this one hasn't hit Board Game Arena. It would work great because it's all simultaneous play and you wouldn't be able to... Because one of the things that's difficult in this game, and I'm going a bit off script here, but one of the things that's really difficult in this game is while you are brewing your pot, it's all done simultaneously. You are not supposed to look at what the other players are doing. That kind of gives you an unfair advantage. And it's hard not to look, like to do the glance over. You don't want to do that, right? That kind of ruins it. Now, there is a method to play where you could take turns. Everyone draws one chip, you do it, and then you have that perfect information. And yes, the game will get more strategic, but you're also going to like double or triple the play time. And I will admit, it's hard to focus on your pot. And I, it's even more impossible to not groan or give something away. But I think that's part of the game. Where you're like, yes. Oh, or if I hear D's like, oh, but using those words D's like to use. I'm like, oh, I can probably keep pulling because it sounds like things are going bad for her. So that is an aspect of the game that I think would be perfect on Board Game Arena. Because you couldn't see other people's pots. Anyway, enough on, on my side tangent there. Next, we did try another game. And this time what we did is we mixed up the one and two books. Uh, we put back some of the ones that let us mitigate the cherry bombs that we liked. Um, and then we flipped the player boards. So that was something someone asked after last week is if we tried the second side of the boards. Now we have. So what this does is it adds a new system to the game where instead of one droplet marker, you have two. One's on the board for thickening your brew, but the other one's on your player board. And it goes a bunch uh, on top of a bunch of test tubes. And it starts on the first test tube, which gives you nothing. Now, every time during the game, you could advance your drop. You pick which one to move. So you either thicken your pot or you get the set reward and the set rewards escalate. Like they start off with like almost like get a free Ruby, maybe get one point, get a free one chip all the way to the end where you're getting like four or five points or you're drafting four chips for free. I thought this was interesting, but not nearly as game changing as swapping up what books were in play. Like, honestly, I'll play with either side of the board. It, it Take it or leave it. It, it literally, eh, it, it was a, a variant. It didn't feel worse. It didn't feel better. I was okay with it either way. So for me, that would be leaving it up to who else I'm playing with. Like, hey, if you have a preference on using the other the B side, we'll use the B side, or we'll stay on the other side. So uh, interestingly, I just discovered that there is apparently a Quax TTS mod that's uh, <laughs> after, well after playing with TTS the other day. I don't know. We'll, well we might have to check it out. Yeah, yeah. D Dini still needs to install hers, but uh, or accept it at least before it yeah. gets canceled. Uh, <laughs> do they after a certain time 28 more days and it will be canceled oh, I, got right. the, got I got an email days. this morning <laughs> alright right, what do you got so uh, we were sent a digital advanced copy of a book by John Michael Garapi winning streak tales and trivia of the 40 most popular board games cool there is a web page but at this point it only takes your information for notification about a forthcoming kickstarter and I noticed actually today, following the link in that you dropped in the, the notes, that link no longer works and redirects somewhere else. Oh, interesting. So well, don't copy that link over right now. <laughs> okay. Well, I want to thank John Michael for giving us the opportunity to read this, though yeah. I have to admit my thoughts on it ended up a bit mixed. So off the top, I want to say I'm impressed with the work that went into this book. Mm -hmm. Not only do I feel its chosen topics were pretty well understood by the author, they even put in footnotes so you could jump around and you know check nice. check the, the topics that they were talking about. For all the faults I did find in this book, thorough research on what they decided to talk about wasn't a concern. Sounds good. Now, after reading the book, I have to say I wasn't shocked when I googled the author's name to discover that the author is a podcaster. 
Okay. Unfortunately, the book reads very much like a podcast. In fact, hmm. at multiple times during the book, the editor inserts himself from the future as one might in an audio or video recording. It's jarring and sadly not as funny as I suspect it was among the author's <laughs> friends and fellow gamers. Uh, that almost sounds like they just took like podcast transcripts and ported them into the book like directly. And I got to say, as someone who does a podcast, uh, we're doing it right now, and writes up blog articles based on the same podcast topics, I know full well those are two very different formats, each requiring different tone and style. Yeah. So my first concern is that the book is a complete lie. <laughs> The title mentions the 40 most popular board games. The author then himself goes on to explain that for some reason they chose Ranker.com as their source for the list in October of 2015. Wait, this is a new book though, right? Yep, yep it's not released yet. Now, this is a questionable choice for a list at any time. But Ranker itself doesn't especially follow its own rules and guidelines as they specify... It needs a board, but as the author points out, not all games listed need a board. Now, while the top 10 of this list haven't, as one might expect, changed all that drastically, the rest of the list is the Wild West, and the 2015 number 40 is currently sitting at number 80, and too high at that spot, being the regular topic of hatred on this show, Candyland. Top. 80th game of all time, Candyland. So this game is talking about popular board games voted on by everyone and anyone, not necessarily board game players, right? So most of the people on sites like Ranker probably followed a Facebook link to some list and decided to continue on and vote on other ones. And these are going to be mostly from people who probably fondly remember playing games as a kid or have no idea what hobby board games are. And to be honest, not all of them are even board games. That, well, that's what we got here? Well, yeah, it depends on what you consider a board game. So Ranker okay. says, a board game here is defined as any game in which pieces are placed on or moved around a flat surface, such as a board. Okay. But do Mastermind, Boggle, or Splendor fit that definition? And if Splendor and Dominion, which are there, on the list, <laughs> why isn't Magic the Gathering? Yeah. Like, Mastermind, I would say, is a board game, but it's not flat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Boggle has no board. Splendor yeah. has no board. Dominion has no board. So, yeah, Magic the Gathering should be there. Ashes should be there. Yep. Uh, every card game. Uh, yeah. All right. So, sadly, the author, as I was saying with the podcast concept, had a struggle staying on track in their writing. At one point, they veer off from a discussion of Catan and take eight pages about how to house rule Catan and fix it, immediately following that with a chapter on house rules that argues both sides of house rules being good and bad and ends by saying that Catan is so old that you can do whatever you want. I can only assume as a means of justifying the previous slog of pages I was forced to muddle through. Not to mention the fact, like Monopoly, Catan doesn't need to be fixed by house rules. And the fact that Catan is happily ensconced at number one currently today on the list is currently is a strong indication of that very fact. <laughs> now, okay, then. the final two games in the book, number two and number one in October 2015, each have a chapter dedicated to them. First, number two featuring a lengthy discussion of game shows, okay. which with 12 pages used to talk about a failed Monopoly game show, ignoring the actual ripe and storied history that the board game of Monopoly itself has. So in this list, one was Catan, two was Monopoly? No, uh, sorry, currently Catan is number one. Right now, oh. number two is Monopoly. Or at, at 2015... Uh, Monopoly was number two. Uh, it's currently seated at number 21. Uh, now, to wrap it up, the number one game, he took eight pages on chess. As the final chapter descends into a chat about free will and literally says, 
that a bunch of the writers don't get it because they didn't discuss the spirituality of chess. Since that time, chess has fallen to number five on the list. The spirituality tied to whatever. I, I, this guy's already lost me. <laughs> so while all in all, there were some interesting tidbits in this book. There really were. And again, I, like I said, they really yeah. did their research well on the topics they chose to speak about. And that's what I want to, you know, that's kind of the focus <laughs> of it all. It would make a much better free podcast than a book someone was going to pay for. And at 200 pages, it's not going to be, you know, well, eventually it will be on the bargain bin, bin somewhere. I got to admit right here, we, we did not intentionally plan for this to be the negative review episode. <laughs> that was not my intention. Um, the writer of this book reached out to me and I was like, I don't have time to read a book. So I sent over to Sean and said, hey, you read a lot of ebooks. You want to read this out and share some thoughts? So we shared our thoughts. Uh, I, you don't need to pass that back to me. It's digital. It doesn't work that way. But <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't feel the need to read this. Anyone who is basing a best of anything list on Ranker, so I got to admit, hearing this, maybe I need to write a book. I'm a <laughs> podcaster. I'll tell you about 40 actually good games. And I can give you the history on all of them. And I won't care about the spirituality of chess. There you go. Anyway, getting back to my table. Dan and I also played our first game of a game hot off the pile of obligation. And that was Techlandia. Uh, while I wasn't expecting much for this game, it was so much worse than that. Uh, to quote Deanna, you will never get me to play that game ever again. Now, I've shared my piece about this game in the review segment, so if you're just joining into the podcast or you missed that, feel free to check that out if you need to know more. But trust me, you don't really need to know more. It's not a good game. Well, how about a look ahead? What do you have planned for the coming weeks? All right, up next on the pile of obligation is Robotech Crisis Point, which I plan to review next Wednesday. Now, I can say with some confidence that this is going to be better than Techlandia. Maybe I'm totally wrong. Maybe I'm going to get, I read the rule book and it doesn't sound bad. And then when I play, it'll be terrible, but I don't think so. Um, I'm also, I would like to introduce our girls to Quacks, uh, at least the oldest. I'm not sure if the youngest will, will be able to handle that one. It could go either way. I really don't know. Um, I worry that she's, because you play independently, maybe cheating. I could see her pulling things and then not liking them and putting them back in the bag. We were trying to instill on her that that's not something you should be doing during gaming, but it's she's at that age where she wants the free will or she wants to win or she wants to be able to compete. So it's something to work on. So I don't know. I want to try it either way. I, to be honest, I want to try it with both kids, but I think it might go over better with the other. Uh, I've also got a growing list of packages here, which I invite everyone in our chat room, you lobbyists, to stick around for the after show to see what I've got. Um though I think at this point we spoiled most of them already. <laughs> um, all three of them, people should be able to guess through hints if they, if they, if they at least know the one game I don't think anyone will guess because they haven't heard of it. Um, and we're just, I'm just looking, hoping to play some more games. Uh, we do have a game night plan this weekend. So I, I was really hoping to get in some kids' games too uh, before spring break ended. So I would like to get down and play some Hogwarts, take on the next book, maybe next two books, and try to get through that. And uh, life here has been busy with uh, work and pandemic. So I'm actually still working on reading worldwide wrestling and getting through that uh, before I jump into uh, blades. Oh, fair enough. It happens. I no, I need to start reading an RPG again. I feel like after finishing white star, I should have picked up something else, but really I should just dig into more rule yeah, books because exactly. I unboxed a bunch of stuff and I haven't read all the rules for all of them yet. Yep. Now a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our VIP guests, our Patreon backers. We greatly appreciate their support. Evil John, I hope all the running I see you doing is offsetting some of those fantastic looking snacks. I don't know. He apparently had an ice cream emergency tonight, so. Oh, oh, oh maybe a bad time. <laughs> Matt, <laughs> Matt Lichtenwalder. Thanks, Matt. Roger Malosh, four months. All right. So about four months, we should actually be able to sit down and game together again. I, about that because i uh, like we sean has a list now we have the when sean list roger's starting to make a mo list games that mo has promised to teach me when we can get together again so right. it's coming soon hope so hope nothing throws a wrench into that anymore zopi thank you brian sheehan thanks again for the great topic a couple weeks back keep them coming we've gotten some great questions from brian in the last little while well that was the double bell 
That means my shift's coming to an end, and we're going to have to lock those front doors. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us all across the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. You can visit our website at tabletopbellhop.com, find the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming News pod, Gaming Podcast on your podcatcher of choice, and sign up for our newsletter at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com for weekly updates. As always, links down below. Also, if you like the content we're providing and would like to support our continued effort, please consider tipping your bellhops at patreon.com slash tabletop bellhop. Well, that wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For the lobbyists, thanks for joining us. Be sure to stick around and join us in the penthouse suite for the after show unboxings. For Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And game on.